Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Side by Side with the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services, Improving Our System monthly webinar. Before we get started, here are a few reminders about the webinar technology. Please make sure you're using a computer or smartphone connected to the internet, the audio function is on, and the volume is turned up. Please be sure your microphone is muted for the duration of the call unless you are speaking or asking questions. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation using the Q&A feature located on your control panel. We will answer as many questions as time allows toward the end of the presentation. American Sign Language Interpreters and closed captioning options are available for today's event. The American Sign Language interpreters for today are Danette Steelman Bridges and Susan King Lanier. For closed captioning options, select the closed caption feature located on your dashboard. To adjust your video layout and screen view, select the view feature located in the top right hand corner of your screen and choose the one that works best for you. Today's agenda topics include introductions, the webinar schedule, and mental health, substance use, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and traumatic brain injury system updates. Our focus today is direct support professionals. We will review actions to strengthen the workforce and have a conversation with our guest DSPs. There will also be time for questions afterward. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Crosby, Director for the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and substance use services. Thanks a lot, Dana. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kelly Crosby, and I'm the director here at the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services. Um, I always start with just a little bit of biography about me. So if you don't know me, you know a little bit about me. I've been in the field for a very long time. I love this field. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I am a person with lived experience. Today, we've got a really great topic um, in store. Um, we're talking about direct support professionals. Dina went through the agenda with you already. If we could go to the next slide. Um, we do these side-by-side -side webinars every month if this happens to be the first time that you came. So we'll have our next one in February and another one in March. So that's the schedule. If you did sign up for the webinars, you should have a standing invitation um, uh, to all of the meetings. We don't know yet the topic for the next side-by-side -side webinars, but it will likely be about something that we're talking today uh, uh, in our budget, everything we've been funded for from the General Assembly. Uh, we've already talked about crisis. We've talked about justice. Today, we're talking about direct support professionals. We've got other workforce topics coming up, like peer support professionals. So stay tuned to see what the topic will be for February and for March. Next slide. So as a reminder, this is the structure of our community engagement. Um, today is our side-by-side -side webinar. Um, we also have four standing community meetings and folks are welcome to those. If you don't know about them, you will see in the chat, you will see peppered throughout the slide deck, ways that you can email to get connected to any of these groups. Every month we have a side-by-side -side meeting and every month we have a standing group of um, advisory meetings. We've got our State Consumer and Family Advisory Council. We've got that every month. We have a meeting with our LME MCO clinical leadership every month. We have a monthly meeting with providers and provider associations. And we also have a monthly meeting with healthcare behavioral health, uh, the healthcare associations, behavioral health professionals. So those are standing meetings. We'll talk about direct support professionals and other issues at those meetings. And because we got this new $835 million from the General Assembly, we've convened some very specialized advisory groups to help us think about analysis of the system, how we intend to spend our dollars and evaluate the spend of those dollars and, and hopefully the very positive outcomes. We've pulled members from all of our standing work groups and our four advisory groups currently are peer workforce, our direct support professional workforce advisory group, our crisis system advisory group, we just had another meeting this morning, and we also have our supports for justice involved individuals. Remember, there's a hot link right here in this deck. If you're interested, please feel free, fill out that form, tell us which group you wanna be invited in. We're trying to make sure we have representation from hospitals, our LMEs, our providers, our consumers, family members, other interested folks. We've got counties, we've got sheriff's association. 
we've got sister divisions like Medicaid and DCFW and DSS in our work groups too. So all are welcome. This is our system that we're building and strengthening together and your voice is incredibly important. So feel free to volunteer for any of our advisory groups. Next slide. The State Consumer and Family Advisory Council is incredibly important to us because we think people with lived experience, their voice should drive the system. It should say what our system should look like um, and we should be incredibly responsive to that. We get a lot of questions about how to join your local consumer and family advisory committee. So remember each LME, each LME MCO has their own CFAC and we have included in here the contact information for each of the LME MCOs. Now we've talked about consolidation, we'll have a slide. We'll talk more about info that has come out uh, just today on consolidation of the LME MCOs into four. Um, so that will affect CFACs, of course. But remember, we have six CFACs now, we'll have four CFACs, and we will have representation from all the counties and from folks with mental health, substance use, intellectual developmental disabilities, and traumatic brain injury on those consumer and family advisory councils locally. So here's how you can get involved locally. We encourage that as well. Next slide. So I'm gonna run through some updates on the system. Many of these are repeats, but they're incredibly important and they're worth repeating again. We have a very packed agenda. So some of these I'm just gonna blitz through because they're repeats um, and there are hot links on almost every slide. So if you want more information, you can certainly look at the slides and dig deeper into this. Medicaid expansion launch on December 1st, which is incredibly exciting. We've shared in other side-by-side -side and at our advisory groups, some of the wonderful um, tools, uh, one pagers, trainings, FAQs, YouTube webinars on EPASS that our Medicaid team has put together. So this is just a reminder of those. Next slide. This is just another reminder, especially of that EPASS demo, that really wonderful uh, video on how folks can uh, use EPASS to sign up for Medicaid. We also have uh, materials in Spanish. Next slide. Medicaid has also published a Medicaid expansion dashboard, which is really cool. There's a hot link. They, they posted a press release. Big kudos to the Medicaid team for developing this dashboard in partnership with sister divisions like us, but with the community. They have such a large community group and we are tracking folks who are getting enrolled in Medicaid by county, by other demographics. It's very exciting. It's very exciting to hear wonderful statistics like 30,000 more people got Medicaid 40,000 people got prescriptions with their new Medicaid. That's extraordinary. So this dashboard is really cool. Kudos to the Medicaid team. And please go ahead and look at that. Next slide. Want to remind folks about LME MCO consolidation. You've seen the slide before. It talks about the principles behind consolidation. The secretary really wanted to go into this with guiding principles. Consolidation had to be about what is best for the people we support, how can we get to tailored plans and have some stability in our system? And how can we reduce complexity in the system? So those were the guiding principles. We are down to four LME MCOs. Um, we will have uh, uh, VIA partners, Alliance and Trillium. And two new FAQs were published today. We have been promising additional information Medicaid and our division, DMH, DDS, US, published some joint communication today for both providers and beneficiaries. Those are the hot links. And so those are really critical bits of information about my Medicaid card. How do we know which LME I'm going to be in? What happens if I have a state-funded only contract? What happens about my care manager? Do I have to change agencies? So there's tons of information there about both Medicaid, state and grant funded um, contracts, dollars, processes, um, and there's also information there about CFAC consolidation as well. So please look at those. We are very invested in additional feedback, additional questions, um, and uh, publishing and producing more and talking more in other settings about whatever questions are arising around the consolidation. We are aiming for consolidation by February 1st. Next uh, slide, please. I want to remind folks as well um, about our 988 performance dashboard. We talked about this. Um, when we went through our crisis system changes and our crisis system funding, uh, we published a press release on the 988 dashboard. We will update this every month. It is very exciting. I, I believe the next time we publish it, we'll have hit 100,000 callers to 988. We talk about who's calling, where they're calling from, 
the speed of answer times, how many folks you're getting referred for mobile crisis or other crisis services. This is just really incredible information that we're using. We want you to see it, use it top of mind to both improve the 988 experience, but also think about improving our system. If these are the reasons people are calling, what else do we need to develop and how else do we need to change our system to be responsive to the just growing number of people that are calling 988? Next slide. Another reminder to you all is our LME MCO dashboard. I bring this up because we actually publish the dashboard every month and I wanna make sure folks are taking a look at it. This is a department-wide monthly dashboard of key outcomes in our behavioral health system. There's the smallest of measures on it right now. By no means is it everything that we measure in our LME MCO system, but these are five key things we're really looking at right now. We're looking at Medicaid children in emergency departments and other DSS settings. So kids who are kind of stuck in the emergency room or stuck in a DSS office. We're looking at Medicaid children who are in PRTS, both in-state and out-of-state. We're looking at folks who are in state hospitals and are ready to be discharged into the community. We're looking at people on the innovations wait list to see how many of them are actually getting some kind of service, even while they're waiting for a, a waiver service. Can they get eye option services? Can they get state-funded services? And we're also looking at the number of people who are getting a follow-up for mental health or substance use care after they were admitted. So are they getting timely follow-up after discharge? We walked through that in our October side-by-side. -side. We'll walk through it again shortly just to give them some refresh and orientation to the dashboard. But look at the dashboard. It shows some key things that we're tracking. It talks about what direction we hope these things go in over time, right? For example, we want fewer children in emergency departments in DSS settings. We want fewer children in PRTS. We want fewer people waiting in state facilities to be discharged to the community. So some of those things. You'll see directionality and you'll see trend over time. So the November dashboard is posted. Please look at the links right there. And we will, in a couple of months, we will walk through the dashboard again to look at some trend data and just to refresh or orient people to the dashboard if it's the first time that you're seeing it. Next slide. Just as a reminder, because this is something to celebrate and something that we're working on, and it is a focus of our advisory committees right now. The department has three priorities, behavioral health and resilience, child and family well-being, and a strong and inclusive workforce. We got just incredible investments from our General Assembly in all of the departmental priorities. For the focus of our side-by-side -side and advisory groups are really focused on the 835 million in behavioral health and resilience, but know that behavioral health is interspersed through child and family well-being and strong and inclusive workforce. So major investments, a lot to celebrate, and a lot that we're working on from the department and with our community partners. Next slide. This is the slide we're gonna show every time because these are our behavioral health budget provisions that we've got in this biennium budget. We've talked about our crisis and we are working with our advisory group on those crisis investments. Same thing for justice. We did our justice session last time. We're working with our justice advisory group. We also got a bunch of money in wellness recovery and workforce. So today we're actually going to be drilling down a little bit more on that. You see that line item that says um, behavioral health workforce training. We're gonna drill down a little bit more on that. So we're going to use some of that to support direct support professionals. So that's why we're drilling down on this too. Next slide. As a reminder, Part of all about 835 million for behavioral health rate increases. I'll draw your attention to the hot links. They'll take you right to the Medicaid bulletin. That's the source of truth for these behavioral health rate increases. We're super excited. It's the first time we've had rate increases in a decade. And we need them. We need an infusion of workforce and we need to pay folks who are doing this incredibly wonderful community-based work. We need to pay them for the wonderful work that they do helping folks move into recovery. So that's just a reminder about the behavioral health rate increases and where you can find that information on the Medicaid website. On the next slide, I'm going to remind folks about the IDB, so the Intellectual Developmental Disability and Traumatic Brain Injury Budget Provisions. Remember, we got 350 new innovation slots. So as those are rolling out, we'll share information here with you. Um, there's gonna be a next slide on the direct support professional wage increases, so I'll hold that. We got $10 million for competitive integrating employment 
And there were also rate increases for personal care services, which a lot of our folks with IDD and TBI who were on Medicaid use. And very excitingly, we got the authority to expand the traumatic brain injury waiver. Our joint teams here at DMH, DDS US, and um, Medicaid have been working on how we're going to plan the TBI waiver expansion. That will include an advisory group, so stay tuned for more information about that. It will be critical that we're working collaboratively with you, the community, with our LME MCOs on the design of uh, that waiver request, actually, to CMS. On the next slide, here's just a quick reminder and the hot link to the Medicaid article on the innovations waiver provider rate increases. So this is taken directly from the Medicaid bullets and look at that hot link because it is the source of truth. We have Medicaid here today on the call too, in case some questions about these or the behavioral health rate increases come up in, in the Q&A at the end. But remember, General Assembly is investing in our workforce. Very exciting and very much a focus overall um, of, our, of our vision uh, for improving our public behavioral health and IDD system. Next slide. So um, in a moment, I'm going to turn things over to some special guests. Um, and uh, kind of as a preface to going into this section where we're talking about actions to strengthen the direct support professional workforce. You know, we started out with funding and we started out with the funding that is for direct support professionals, um, the funding that's for behavioral health professionals, but that's not the only thing, right? So if we go on the next slide, I want to tell you a little bit about something that we have referenced on Side by Side before and to tell you about something that's coming, hasn't come yet. <clears throat> it, last year, so at the end of 2022 and all through last year, the department, so DHHS, along with the Department of Commerce, they convened something called the Caregiving Workforce Strategic Leadership Council. So it's a, it's a mouthful, it's a lot. And they met routinely. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you the subcommittees because that's really important for us here. They met about our workforce crisis here in North Carolina. They brought in experts across the state. They looked at other states. We brought in consultant experts from AHAC and also Deloitte. And they did an in-depth exploration of the challenges, the current state efforts here in North Carolina and in other states and national efforts to help with workforce challenges. Um, and they wanted to convene this group to look at the challenges, but also suggest some ways to move forward to strengthen our healthcare workforce. It was big, it was caregiving workforce, so it's, it's bigger than us, okay? I'm letting you know about this because this report will be released shortly. It's incredibly important that you know that we were part of that. I got to sit on that council. Um, our team and DHHS, of course, got to give feedback on the recommendations in that report. And we're going to take those recommendations to our DSP advisory group. I need folks to hear that, right? A lot of work went into this. The department will be shortly publishing this report with a lot of exciting recommendations and ways to move forward. So I want folks to know uh, if you didn't, that that leadership group was convened for coming up with recommendations, and we intend to look at them and think about how we can use them, fund them. Um, they are the things that our community is suggesting that we need to do to help our workforce. On the next slide, the last thing I'll say about the Caregiving Workforce Strategic Leadership Council is it had three primary areas of focus, and this is critical. Two of the three were directly about our field. So there was a, a convening on nursing. I mean, the nursing touches us and the people that we support very much, but there was a whole subgroup on behavioral health workforce and a whole subgroup on direct care. Now that was larger than direct support professionals for IDD and TBI, it included things like home care workers. Um, but again, direct support professionals were a big part of this direct care subcommittee. So when the report comes out and it's soon and we will announce it, um, there will be uh, clear recommendations for strengthening the behavioral health workforce and also the direct care workforce inclusive of our direct support professionals. Okay, next slide. So we're doing a variety of things in the direct support professional workforce space. So there's a lot of words on this slide, but I wanted to give folks a little understanding of some of the things we're working on, have worked on to date, and some of the things that you can expect to see us rolling out in the new year. 
So way back in July, and this is um, leading up to, to introducing our AHEC guest speakers today, way back in July, um, DHHS commissioned AHEC to do a study on the direct care worker shortage. And they're going to talk specifically about what it is that they looked for, for, for DHHS and who they talked to. So I'm gonna let them do that. In September, AHEC gave us their recommendations. Um, in November, in the workforce space, we had uh, direct support professional wage increases and Medicaid published those in November. In January, which is now, we've actually published the AHEC report. So there's the hot link on things that we can do to help direct support professionals. If you go to the next slide, it talks about today. Today, we actually have the AHEC folks here, Jill and Caroline are here. They were the uh, the conveners of all the folks who created this report, they wrote the report, they met with us about the report. And so they're going to share the details of the report with us today. In a few days, we're actually going to meet with CFAC on that report. We're going to, today's high level, but with our CFAC, we're going to break it down and talk about the recommendations. We're going to ask, how do you guys feel about it? Directionally, is this where we should focus our effort to do HDBS US? Should we do that? And we'll do the same thing in later January at our direct support professional advisory committee. Same thing, we got these wonderful recommendations. We need you to tell us, yes, this is right, this feels right. Let's do it in this order, put your energy here. So we really need that kind of feedback. And in spring, after we continue to meet with our direct support professional advisory committee, we've digested the AHEC report. We've digested other recommendations from the advisory committee from the CFAC. We've digested recommendations from that Strategic Caregiving Workforce Council that I mentioned, we will come up with our go forward plan for direct support professionals. So besides rates, what other things would really help us to strengthen and support our direct support professional workforce? So besides rates, which are paramount, right? Which are really critical. What else should we be focusing on putting in place and using some of our other legislative dollars for? So we're working on that now. With that, if you go to the next slide, I'm actually gonna turn things over to my colleagues at AHEC, Jill and Caroline, they'll introduce themselves. And they'll also talk about the report and the recommendations. But remember, this is pretty high level um, because we will use our CFAC and also our DSP advisory group to really unpack the recommendations and discuss them. So over to you, Jill. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you for moving to the next slide already. Um, that was that was a great lead way into what we're going to talk about, and I'm probably going to talk a little bit fast so that we can get through our slides. Um, and then Caroline is with me. Um, she is also here. She can help monitor the chat and answer questions if needed. Um, first, my name is Jill Fursina. I'm the Director of Education and Nursing for North Carolina AHEC. Um, I do have a clinical background in nursing. And then Caroline is the Associate Director of Continuing Professional Development with us. Um, next slide, please. So Kelly gave a really good overview of what we were asked to do. Um, so I don't think I need to go over this um, slide in all that much detail. Um, but we were given a contract with the Department of Health Benefits. Um, and the deliverable um, was a re final report on recommendations um, for certification as part of a recruitment and retention program in, for workers in the home and community-based um, settings workforce. Next slide. In creating our plan, um, we wanted to do a bunch of things, but a couple of ground rules was ensure that training and career advancement, advancement opportunities are accessible to all, um, ensure that nothing in the plan created any primary or secondary bar barriers to working in direct care, and to obtain buy-in from both employers, employees, as well as patients and families, by recognizing existing curricula and training accomplishments, and then also ensuring flexibility. Um, on the screen are sort of the steps that we've taken, not necessarily in this order, but we started with a literature review to understand the current status of the workforce, as well as what credentialing programs for the workforce already exist. Um, we consulted with subject matter experts from the state, with providers, um, from workers themselves, from the LMEMCOs, family members and individuals with lived experience, um, and other individuals and organizations that are working in this field to identify what's currently happening in North Carolina, as well as what are North Carolina's specific needs. Um, we also did some research on um, about uh, what other states are doing and on a nationally util utilized system for tracking worker competencies. We looked at training platforms that were designed specifically for the direct care workforce as well. 
Um, and all of these efforts are described in more detail in the report itself. Next slide. So as we went through this process and the more we talked to people, we developed the four assumptions or premises that you see on your screen in order to build our recommendations. The first one is that we gotta have reliable funding. Um, any plan to address the recruitment and retention of the direct care worker workforce requires a significant investment from, um, from the state, from insurers, from employers. Um, unfunded, uncoordinated, and uncoordinated mandates we know will result in a weak, inefficient, inefficient and ineffective system. Um, and potentially also lead to unintended consequences. So we made that our very first premise that money is needed to invest in this. The second premise um, is understanding that direct care workers move between settings, specialties, and populations. We feel like addressing the crisis in one area at the expense of another would be an ineffective solution. We know there's high job turnover rates among these workers. We know that they switch practice settings. They often juggle multiple jobs simultaneously and maybe even quickly progress from one setting to another or taking care of one population to another. Um, focusing solely on workers in one setting would draw direct care workers away from other settings rather than attracting new talent. And when our goal was how are we going to attract new talent and keep current talent? Um, so we thought it was essential to recognize that there's an interconnectedness of direct care workers across settings um, and to really view the healthcare landscape as like an integrated framework. So the report predominantly discusses all direct care workers rather than just focusing on home and community-based settings. Um, the third premise is that there's a lot of really good um, currently existing and utilized direct care worker training curriculum platforms out there. Um, we do not want to create, we do not want to recreate the wheel. We don't want to create further obstacles for direct care workers. Um, so instead, our approach um, intends to enhance existing comprehensive and competency-based efforts, and then also to optimize them to foster professional development. And then the fourth premise is the development and implementation of a certification program alone will not solve the direct care worker crisis. Kelly sort of talked about this already too. We can recruit and train all the direct care workers in the world all day long, but the problem won't be solved unless there's efforts to retain them um, through work culture change, wage increases, and wraparound supports. Next slide, please. So under those four assumptions, we developed an implementation support plan for direct care workers in all settings, including home community-based settings that contain six core elements that you see on your umbrella on the screen. And I'm gonna go over each of them individually. Next slide. So umbrella element number one is implementing this umbrella system that incorporates new and existing training options. So this umbrella system that we were envisioning should offer a tiered competency framework that um, both um, embraces and also streamlines existing experience and training and on the job learning um, that's within a bigger system of buildable skills and qualifications. Um, we felt that employers should have the freedom to determine the training needs for their workers and that the status quo has to be the entry level um, for, direct, uh, for a direct care worker. So that if people who are currently working in the direct care worker space could continue working in the direct care worker space without having to leave the field in order to do new training. Next slide. Uh, the second element is to adopt common core competencies. Um, the, common core, the core competencies are the essential knowledge, um, skills, and, um, and behaviors that are needed for effective performance. For example, in the direct care worker space, it's noted that communication, person-centered practices, evaluation and observation, crisis prevention, workplace safety, professionalism, um, and, then, and cultural competence are pretty common around all direct care worker spaces, not, not in one setting or the other. Um, and with a foundation like that, we can we can get everybody on the same page and then add additional competencies um, for, to address specific needs in various contexts, whether that be the direct care worker wants to develop themselves professionally in a specialty or if an employer needs um, their employees to have specific training as well. Next slide, please. And the third element was to ensure the accessibility of training for all direct care workers. Um, so any learning management system with training in it uh, should be able to support stackable certifications and follow the learner. So, so that if you do a training with your employer, um, it doesn't get stuck with your employer, but can go with you between jobs uh, or between settings if you have multiple jobs. Um, we also thought that it needed to be portable via um, like a smart device, so accessible on a phone and not just a computer. Um, they would need to have annotation capabilities. 
um, cater to adult learning, be available in multiple languages, compatible with assisted devices, and also um, prove as a method for tracking so that we could be able to have everybody under one, that one umbrella system, getting becoming um, uh, competent workers, but also that system serving as a tracking mechanism for us. Another piece of this premise was that employers would need to also be able to um, invest in this and provide paid time for worker training and development to make it more accessible for those learners. And I'm gonna go back to that in another couple of slides. So hang on to that. Um, next slide, please. Um, the fourth premise is to develop an infrastructure for administration and oversight of credentialing. I think this one's pretty obvious, but it's incredibly crucial that we do this well. Um, we need an infrastructure for plan ex execution, outcome assessment, more planning, um, and then also to have a, to monitor a, um, a stackable credentialing system. Uh, this would involve designating a lead organization, forming an advisory committee, which I know we've already done in some spaces. Um, and then we also envision that employers would re receive um, implementation resources like um, a consultant group and a handbook for clear implementation guidelines and best practices as well. Um, next slide, please. So I promised I would go back to um, what I said earlier about employers um, needing to be invested and allowing for their employees to um, have release time to get this training done. The fifth element is sort of goes along very well with what Kelly was talking about earlier is to connect competency attainment with both wage wage increases and rate differentials. Um, what that would actually look like is beyond the scope of what this contract was. Um, but we do know that linking competency achievement to rate differences for employers and wage increases for workers encourages participation. Um, training costs and the time needed to take trainings cannot burden the workers. Um, and employers need to be adequately compensated to support worker training and advancement. Integrating rate differences promotes higher wages for direct work, work care workers and, and encourages employer buy-in as well and incentivizes workers to grow professionally. We did look at a bunch of other states, both in the infrastructure and how they um, built out their statewide supports for direct care workers, but also at how they were um, attaching it to wages and um, rate differentials. Next slide, please. So the sixth and final element that we recommended um, was that we need to be able to provide additional wraparound services for these workers. Um, supports in our view range widely from just the fulfillment of basic human needs um, to creating hope for the future. Um, so recognizing that direct care workers are currently underpaid, they're often marginalized. Um, comprehensive social services, services um, can enhance workplace success. They need to be able to come to work and they need to be able to stay at work. Um, Key areas requiring support um, that we identified include childcare, transportation, um, and access to safe, affordable housing. And we actually already have an infrastructure for that in the state through NC Care 360. So in this one, I actually think we're a couple steps ahead of the game um, as compared to some of those others. Um, next slide, please. We believe this plan could take up to three years to implement fully. Um, and I think that that's probably being optimistic. Um, but it will also still, once it's implemented fully, would still require a lot of work to tweak in order to measure effectiveness. And we see multiple um, plan do study act cycles going through. Um, we did try to break down in the report what the next few steps would be. And that's what you see on this slide right here. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read them to you, but I want to emphasize that the first step that we recommended was to conduct a peer review. Um, the time frame in which this report was completed did not allow for Caroline and I for a thorough peer review peer review, um, and it, it is still needing a peer review that um, is intentional and includes direct care workers themselves, as well as the people who receive those services and their families. And it sounds like those are the steps that are being taken. Next slide. And that is it. If anybody has any questions, um, our emails are on the page. Feel free to reach out to either of us, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. I'll hand it back over. Thank you so much, Jill. That was phenomenal. And, and Jill and Caroline and the whole AHEC team have just done an amazing job working in collaboration with you all. So thank you. Remember, this is a high-level overview. And on the next slide, remember our community collaboration model. We do have our DSP advisory committee. Um, we will be unpacking this um, um, in much greater detail. I'd like to point out that there's also been some really detailed, very weedy questions in the Q&A today. We probably won't get to some of them, 
but our team has already picked them up to transport them over to that advisory committee because they are worth the discussion. They're a little more than a Q&A. So thank you for those comments and keep them coming. All right. Now we are going to do, I think, next slide, please. We're going to have the most exciting part of our day today. We'll probably have only a little bit of time for Q&A at the end because I want to make sure that we have a lot of time to, um, I'm going to introduce um, Cameron Kempson and Bradley Smith to join me on screen if you guys are willing. You might be on screen. I just can't see you. There's Bradley. Hello, Bradley, who is not Michael Smith. He is Bradley. Hello. And I'm here too, Kelly. Yeah, I'm Hello, here. Cameron. Great to see you. Thank you both for coming. So um, folks, um, I'm so excited to have Cameron and Bradley join us today. They are direct support professionals. I've got a bunch of questions to ask them. We're hoping to have a conversation, but um, I think Jill said it. Cameron said it when we got to meet before. And uh, if you all know Tina Barrett, Tina Barrett sure as heck said it um, here at DMHCBSUS. If we're going to talk about direct support professionals and we're going to talk about really what the needs are, we really, really need to talk to the direct support professionals. So we are honored and grateful that Cameron and Bradley were able to join us today. So can I get you both just to introduce yourselves? Would you mind? Sure. So my name is Cameron Kempson and I am the Director of Education for Community Bridges. Um, I've been in the field for, gosh, over 30 years and most recently was a direct support professional when I made a transition between two contracts as a consultant and needed some full-time work. So um, I had been a direct support professional to put myself through graduate school at UNCG a long time ago and then came back to it this past summer. And I, I'm Bradley Smith. And I've been a DSP for the last 12 years, working under the same provider full time. Most of the time I've worked there. Um, when I first started, I was balancing it with going to school at Wake Tech. And um, at the time, this was just a temporary job for me when I first started it that I wouldn't have expected to have been in this long. But it's amazing how doing something like this can change a person and their perspective on where they want to go. So I've I've been working with the the same family the whole time as well, we, and it's been quite an amazing experience. And uh, well, the changes that I can make in someone's life and they can make in mine as well constantly surprise me every day, even after all these years. Thank you so much, Cameron and Bradley. And Bradley, you did such a nice segue into the first question. So do you mind if I start with you? No, go ahead. So you kind of you kind of answered this a little bit, but how did you find yourself in this profession? Well, it, at first I was just trying to find work. And at the time it was hard to, to find new jobs. And, and uh, I was up on college campus at NC State going for a jog and came across a flyer that was posted for this job and decided to make a phone call. It, it, uh, I, I hadn't thought about healthcare or working in this field before. And, um, you, you know, I, I've worked in kitchens and did inventory and all kinds of different jobs, but uh, it was a great opportunity and it was it just happened to be the first job that called me back, but it was kind of like a calling to get into it. I love it. Thank you, Bradley. Cameron, how about you? How did you get into this profession? Yeah, so when I was in graduate school, I was working um, as an intern at Family Support Network, and the person who was running Family Support Network had a son who was 16 and she really wanted him to have some community-based education and experience. So um, I worked part-time with John and um, spent full afternoons working out in the community and um, getting to know people, but also learning how to be more independent. And then this past year, um, found myself in a place of needing some full-time work and had a friend who said, you know, I've got a three-year-old with 
disabilities and that's your background and wouldn't that be a great match? And um, so I took her up on the offer and really am just so grateful to have gone back to that. It feels like I came full circle 30 years later um, to be back in with the DSP field and reminding myself of not only what is really at the heart of what I do, regardless of my job, but also um, at the heart of, of this whole field, um, the people that are out there doing that day-to-day -day support. I'm speaking on mute. I can't, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a silly mistake. Thank you both for that. I think um, it's been really interesting to talk to direct support professionals and families about how folks even knew that this was a career. And I've, I've heard the whole spectrum. I think we all have, right? They knew they wanted to be in a helping profession. I've talked to a lot of people who knew they wanted to be a CNA and work with older adults or provide home care, and they didn't know a direct support professional was an option. And other folks who just like, I needed a job and I heard about this through the grapevine and that's how I got the job. So lots of different paths, but Cameron, we'll start with you on this one. We, we talk about, and I hope we celebrate it. And I think we need to celebrate it more how valuable direct support professionals are in our lives. I talk about how um, uh, two of the most incredibly important people to me has spent a lot of time with direct support professionals, my son and my, my, um, my grandma. Uh, they weren't IDBs, direct support professionals, but they spent so much time with them and they were the most valuable people in my life. And so incredibly valuable. But I would love to hear from you guys. How do you view the value of the work of DSPs? Cameron, you're on mute now. <laughs> Will you repeat the question you went out on me on that last question? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, I was, it's okay. I would love to know how, how do you view the value of the work that you do as a direct support professional? Sure. So I, coming from the perspective of, of DSP, I can say that I felt like I, the, the young man and then the young lady, the little girl that I worked with, that I, I had a lot of opportunity to see them across a lot of different settings and engaged in a lot of different activities. And what that did was um, create one more person besides the family who had a, a really broad perspective of this, you know, this individual's gifts and talents and abilities and skills. Um, that could make an impact on how services and other supports were provided. Um, I went to OT appointments. I supported the family in being able to access other services. And so I think one thing we forget about DSPs sometimes is that they're caring for the family, the family as a whole, not just for the individual they're with. And they are an integral part of that natural support system, even as a direct support person. Um, that gives um, a bigger picture of the individual that that they work with in the day to day, and that's critical for assessment, right? You know, for assessment, for service provision, for care coordination, all of those things. Thanks, Kim. Bradley. What about you? How would you describe the value of what direct support professionals do? Um, it th there's a lot of values that I it, it's it's really hard to sum that up an answer to that question but one thing that I think is great about this job is so, some of the individuals will work with being with just their family and without our support might not get a lot of opportunity to get out in their community and get to know the people in their community and those people know that 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 person is even a, a part of their community as a whole. And with, when I take someone out of their home and out in the community and uh, uh, they get to see the individuals in their community who are happy to help them without me doing some things directly, like when they go to the grocery store and someone wants to help reach something for them and they understand that there's compassion out there beyond someone who's also paid to provide the service and they they understand that they have a community around them that is happy to get to know them and it 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 really can 
strengthen a, a lot of self-confidence in somebody to know that's out there, that they won't be able to get just in their home and w w while they're with their own family. And uh, w without having that extension of us there to support them, it, their their family might also find it to be a struggle to be able to to do their work or to have a personal life themselves because um that having a son myself who uh it struggles with his autism at home it, i know how much it can be consuming in your personal life to not have support there for them and always be the one providing for them when you're not at work so it it uh, it's just it's it's really emotional to talk about sometimes, but it I find that it you can just talk all day about how how beneficial it is both to to the the individual, their family, and like like I said, because they're a part of a community, that the, the community doesn't seem whole without everybody in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Bradley. Thank you. Um, can I switch gears for a second? Let me try to switch gears. All right. Mm -hmm. So. What do you, and I'll start with you, Bradley. What do you wish you knew before your first day on the job as a DSP? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, before I first started this job, um, it, you know, tra training's always kind of been limited before you meet a family and you start learning how to work with that individual. And I really didn't understand a whole lot about different disabilities educationally before I started this job. And e even with the training through my employer, uh, I found myself kind of taking words and uh, names of disabilities and Google searching them and educating myself before I showed up. And uh, that also, it felt like the concentration on education before you meet individuals you work with is missing that personal touch. And uh, you're always going to get that personal touch once you work with them. But because that's such an important part of the job, it, I kind of wish there was a way to get get a little training in, in the field before you start getting assigned to work with individuals. Because I, I've also, since I started this job, went through CNA training and got certification in that. And one thing I liked about that platform was that you had to do some infield work and before you were able to be licensed, able to work in the field at yourself as an individual. And it, it really put that personal connection there that can be missed. We lost you for a second. Uh, I'm sorry. It, that was all I had to say. Thank you. No, thank you for that. I, uh, Bradley, I appreciate. Um, yeah. uh, you know that 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 sounds like some feedback we've heard from other folks and families that there's the pre-training, but also the really getting to know a person and a family and how very person-centered this job really is if you do it really well. And, uh, so thank yeah. You for that. Cameron, how about you? What you wish you knew before your first day? Yeah, I, I, I echo a lot of what Brandon was uh, saying because I had the education background. I was in the disabilities studies world, but you walk in and you meet the family the first time, even if you've had a conversation and it feels like there's this kind of onboarding gap, you know, professional onboarding around the family and around the child themselves. You know, we may get CPR training, we may have all of these other generic trainings, but um, having somebody on board with me on the family and the child in a very, in a more structured way would have been helpful. Um, you know, reviewing the IFSP or the IEP or any kind of other plans that are um, supporting this individual, having um, introductions, more formal introductions to the therapist that I would be uh, exposed to as I, you know, took the individual into the community. So I, 
I would love to see education and professional development expand into a more structured onboarding process for DSPs beyond just kind of the book work piece or the understanding disabilities piece and really thinking about how do we take people in other fields and prepare them to do their job and apply that to the DSP industry. Thank you. That is super helpful. And, and that actually hits some of the other questions. One of the one of the things that I'm heard, I'm sure that you both heard was that, you know, the APEC report talks a lot about a standardized training that is, that is portable. Um, and I think you guys are making some really excellent points about some of the some of the didactic knowledge that you want to learn, but also the real hands-on training and maybe some more standardization around that. Um, and 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 the really critical person-centeredness of actual work that you're going to do with a particular individual and their families. But there's something I wanted to ask you about. You guys didn't touch on this. So one of the things that the AHAC folks recommend as well, or and we've heard discussed, it's nationally it's being discussed, this idea of having a registry of direct support professionals. So direct support professionals can post their credentials, maybe uh, areas of interest or a background or history that you might have with families and clients, kind of like a, an Angie's List or a LinkedIn. What do you guys think about that idea of a registry? E either one, feel free to go first. Would it help you and do you think it would help family with your experience? I, I think I'll jump in real quick with, with two thoughts. Um, one is that I, to me, that helps build, again, it's one more way to support that professionalization mm -hmm. of, DS, of the DSP world um, and creates an opportunity for collegiality, but also for that um, validation of the work that we're doing and the level of professional development that we've had, if that's you know going to be noted in that registry. The other piece, too, that I, I feel like it could be an open door for is a way to create some statewide systems of communication so that, for example, I was in my most recent um, stint, I was hired directly by the family. And so I didn't go through a provider. And because I didn't go through a provider, I wasn't necessarily in the know of everything in North Carolina that may be of support to me or may be uh, something I could access. So having a platform like you, a registry, then gives you that opportunity too to have a way to communicate with a lot of professionals across the state who may not be linked in specifically through another resource. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. What do you think, Bradley? Uh, I mean, I think it would be a great idea because I've met other DSPs who uh, have talked about how the, even if they work full time, how they wish they could just get more hours or more opportunities. And whenever they they say that, it, it's it's almost surprising. When, in the other hand, I've met a lot of families who say that they don't have the support they need, and it it would be great to have something a little larger than within the individual providers. The, for us to have a way that those DSPs and families can meet each other and communicate. And, you know, it, it might cause a little bit more motion of workers moving around in the system, but I think anything that gets more support provided in the end is a wonderful thing and a great goal to achieve. Well, you mentioned and a question came in from the audience. I think it's really interesting. I want to pick up on. You mentioned the part-time work. How much? How how much of a difference do you think it makes if someone has a full-time job rather than they're working with two or three different people part-time? Does that being able to work full-time and, and know that you have that full-time commitment with the person does that make a, a real difference, or what do you think about that? I think it can make a difference for the the worker themselves if that's something that they're interested in because it, instead of traveling around to to multiple homes and communities and you know having to learn where multiple people's like doctor visit locations are or, and things like that for instance you can 
learn a little more easily a single community in a single area. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, get more involved in, in that community. It might be your own community as well. But uh, on the other hand, for the person who's receiving services, it it gives them more of a sense of solidity to their services, I think. And it, if you can do it in a for a longer amount of time, like I have, it it, it grows a, a great bonding and strength in the relationship. And uh, you know, every individual has certain quirks and things that only their families and close friends usually notice. And when you work with someone long enough and full time, you you easily become close enough to pick up on those extra quirks and tendencies a person has. And the, maybe it could be something as simple as just a warning they're getting a little frustrated with something. And you can step in before it becomes more than it should. And it it, it can just make the the days go by a little smoother or, you know, may, maybe you find common interests that uh, without having a lot of conversation, you wouldn't have realized you had, you know, so, some commonalities of your childhood and things too. So it, it, it can make for, um, I, I, I mean, I know this is a, a job and I always keep a professional mindset about it as well, but it it's, Without having a bonding, I, I just don't see how you could help someone learn to be their best self and learn to be as independent as they're capable of, because uh, you can see where they'd be able to do something no one else has told them they could do. And to be able to support, that's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Brett. Final question for both of you, and I'll start with you, Bradley. I'll keep you here. Because this is really important. And as we think about what we can and should be doing here, you've been doing this for 12 years. You're very clearly passionate and committed to it. Thanks, you stay for 12 years. How, what is it that would help us support people to make a profession and a career and stay in this work for long stretches of time like you have? Well, for me personally, I, you know, I, I've had support of uh, my family, and it, it, that makes a big difference, especially yeah. when um, I, I don't think I could have done this this long uh, with, you know, the the income that the DSPs receive with the going through the, the pandemic and inflation we've been dealing with. It's it and. But uh, community supports or family supports, you know, it, it as other people's lives change, sometimes those can disappear or change on you. And uh, I, I don't think that everyone could do this with longevity if that's all they had to rely on. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know we already um, have increases coming for for wages and it but it having incentives for people who want to do this long term other than just talking about the you know increasing the the reimbursement rates but saying hey it if if you want to do this long term we've structured it like you would see a career yeah. and um because it i've probably spent half my time doing this not even having benefits for myself for health care and you know it, the sacrifices that you make to be able to know you provide someone else services it hits at a personal level and uh, i don't think that uh, we would want anybody to to feel like that just to to provide these needed services to other individuals so it just and, and 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 I know you uh, that everybody's trying to work on having that kind of structure like it families the the state the providers are all trying to come together and figure out how to structure that and it it does take time but it it, it I can say from my own personal perspective that with 
how in inflation has affected people over the last year or so that it's been very impactful on me and my own family. And it, it seems like when you t make a sacrifice before you know it, you're, you're thinking of something else you have to give up. And it, that, like my son is six years old now and my family's not even taken a personal vacation since he was born. So it's, it, but it, when I know that someone's not going to receive any healthcare services in their home, if I take that time off or I just can't financially afford it either, it's, you know, I, I've always gone where my heart tells me to, to, to do what I think is right. And I, I just would like to see people who do what I do and feel that way to feel a, like they're getting a return and like other people see how they struggle as well. So, so other supports, other incentives, a career. Yes. Thank you for that. Bradley. We are at time, but Cameron, I'd love to give you 30 seconds to answer the same question. What would help folks see this as a career, support their longevity? Yes, definitely a livable wage for sure. And I guess what I would consider like wraparound supports, mm -hmm. benefits, mm -hmm. um, retirement plans, all, all those things that other people in other jobs have access to. Um, and then ongoing professional development, you know, our, our field changes and technologies coming into our field, you know, a lot of different ways things cause us to evolve in, in an industry or in a workforce, but we don't necessarily get trained on those. And then we're expected to be accountable. And so I think professionalizing the educational process and professionalizing the way we um, support different ways to retain individuals as DSPs. So thank you. And Cameron and Bradley, if you are not on our advisory committee already and you have the time, we would love to have you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for the valuable insights that you share. Look forward to learning more from both of you. And just thank you for all that you do every day. I'm going to turn this over in one second to Dina to wrap us up. But there's two things I want to say. The DIA has posted some information in the chat because we, had, we didn't get to all the questions. We tried to live answer a lot, but we didn't get to them all. But know that we've got them all in the chat. We'll try to answer them in other venues like the advisory committee. And the second thing I want to say is apparently, even though our, our webinar holds 1,000 attendees, people started getting kicked out once we hit 350. So I'm not sure what happened, but I apologize if you're one of those folks where you've got a friend or a colleague or a loved one who was trying to get on and couldn't. Don't know why we had that glitch today, but we will investigate. Um, and make sure that doesn't happen next time. So Dina, any final cleanup you wanna do? Thank you, Kelly. As Kelly said, if we did not get an opportunity to answer your question during the webinar, questions and feedback are welcome at bhidd.helpcenter at dhhs.nc.gov. The recording and presentation slides for today's event will be posted on our community engagement and training page. The links are included in the chat box. There will be a brief survey following today's webinar, and we would appreciate your time completing it. Our next side-by-side -side webinar is scheduled for Monday, February 5th from 2 to 3, and we look forward to seeing you then. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for attending.